In the quiet corners of Fort Worth, Texas, a chilling mystery lay dormant for nearly half a century. 17-year-old Carla Walker, a cheerful and well-liked junior at Western Hills High School, disappeared on a seemingly ordinary Valentine's Day night after attending a school dance with her boyfriend, Rodney McCoy. What began as an evening of youthful joy quickly descended into a nightmare, leaving her family and friends in hopeless for answers. For decades, her murder remained an unsolved mystery until 2020, when DNA from a decades-old clothing stain solved the 1974 cold murder case. Welcome back to True Crime Expresso, where we delve into the depths of solved and unsolved cases, brooding mysteries, and haunting tales that will keep you up at night. In today's video, we're delving deep into the long-forgotten case of Carla Walker. This tragic tale begins at a bowling alley parking lot, where Carla was assaulted and kidnapped straight from her boyfriend's car by an unidentified man hiding behind a mask. The story takes a turn for the worse when four days after this horrifying event, Carla's lifeless body was found abandoned in a water culvert, leaving no leads or hints behind. Join us as we uncover the shocking truth behind this 46-year long cold case and the unexpected turn of events that led to Carla's case finally being solved. Carla Walker, born on January 31, 1957 in Texas, was the cherished daughter of Leighton and Doris Walker. She harbored dreams of becoming a veterinarian once she completed her education. Fondly remembered by her friends and family, Carla was described as feisty and bubbly, leaving a lasting impression on those who knew her. In the heart of 1974, a time when disco beats echoed through the high school hallways, there was Carla Walker, a 17-year-old at Western Hills High School in Fort Worth. She was a pint-sized bundle of joy, known for her infectious smile that could brighten anyone's day. Carla's golden hair laid down her shoulders, a perfect match to her sunny disposition. She was deeply in love with Rodney McCoy, the quarterback of the football team. Their dreams revolved around a shared future at Texas Tech University, complete with wedding bells and a family. On that fateful February 16th evening, Rodney, grinning from ear to ear, arrived at Carla's cozy Benbrook home. She descended the stairs in a powder blue dress, proudly wearing the promise ring he had given her. As he fastened a corsage to her wrist, the young couple made their way to their school's Valentine's Day dance. A 1969 Ford LTD, Rodney's mother's car, carried them toward a night filled with pink streamers and paper hearts. The night unfolded in a symphony of youthful exuberance. The music of the live band Hydra had set the dance floor ablaze, and when the clock struck 11.30, the party reluctantly came to a close. Rodney then extended an invitation to another couple to join him and Carla on a moonlit journey through the streets of Fort Worth. They meandered along Camp Bowie Boulevard and navigated the Benbrook traffic circle, making pit stops at iconic teen hangouts like Mr. Quick Hamburgers and Taco Bell. Later, as the night darkened, they found themselves alone at the doorstep of Brunswick Ridgeley Bowl. Carla's need for a restroom break led them there. Amidst the hushed glow of the bowling alley parking lot, their passion ignited and they shared kisses in the front seat. But the happiness was shattered when the passenger door was violently flung open by a mysterious figure with short brown hair and a vest. In a terrifying blur, the assailant bludgeoned Rodney with the pistol's butt, causing the gun's magazine clip to clatter to the ground. The shot was strong enough for him to lose consciousness. Panic struck Carla as the man seized her, whispering ominous words. Struggling for consciousness, Rodney heard Carla's desperate plea. Rodney, go get my dad! With adrenaline coursing through his veins, he regained control of the car and raced towards the walker's home less than a mile away. Carla's parents, Leighton and Doris, were still awake, playing dominoes in the dining room with relatives. Carla's little brother Jim, who was 12 years old, and her elder sister Cindy, who was 18, were in the living room watching television. They heard someone banging at the front door and were stunned to see Rodney, blood dripping down his face. He was frantic. Mr. Walker, they've got her, he shouted. They're gonna hurt her bad. Leighton, a retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, grabbed his pistol and raced to the bowling alley. Doris dialed the operator on the family's rotary phone and asked to be connected to the police. Officers soon arrived at the scene. 
Searching the parking lot, they found Carla's purse along with the magazine clip that had been ejected from the assailant's weapon. Other cops drove the surrounding streets in squad cars, scanning for any sign of Carla. When classes resumed on Monday morning, detectives visited Western Hills High. They studied contact sheets of photos taken at the dance, looking for anyone who seemed out of place. They stopped kids in the hallways, asking if they knew anyone who would want to hurt Carla. During the early 1970s, Fort Worth had a population of roughly 400,000, which was less than half its current size. Local proponents marketed the city as a safe and family-friendly haven where doors often remained unlocked. Carla's sister Cindy recalled this innocence regarding crime, explaining that they couldn't fathom Carla being gone forever. They held on to the hope that someone would return her safely. However, the optimism shattered on February 20th, just four days after Carla's disappearance, when two officers searching for her noticed a culvert about five miles from where she was last seen. A culvert is a structure that channels water past an obstacle or to a subterranean waterway. They decided to investigate, and inside the culvert, they found a young woman, Carla, lying on her back. Her face and neck bore painful marks. Her blue dress was stained with blood and torn. Her bra had been pushed above her breasts, and her underwear and pantyhose were tangled together at the culvert's entrance. It was a grim discovery. Carla had been strangled without any ligature marks suggesting the killer had used his hands. Carla's parents were summoned to the hospital morgue to identify their daughter, accompanied by young Jim. The experience was harrowing as Jim remembered his mother's piercing scream when she saw Carla's lifeless body, a sound that would haunt him forever. Carla's tragic murder dominated the front page of the Star-Telegram, spreading shock and sorrow throughout the community. Her funeral, conducted at the Western Hills Church of Christ, drew an overwhelming turnout of over 1,250 mourners, far exceeding the capacity of the modest sanctuary. As her friends passed by Carla's open casket, they were gripped by both grief and fear. Safety concerns ran deep. Even Kathy O'Neill, the yearbook editor, babysat in the neighborhood and made sure to call her parents as soon as she arrived to assure them of her well-being. Others sought solace in self-defense classes, organized by the Western Hills High PTA and led by instructors with black belts in jiu-jitsu. Fort Worth authorities assembled a task force comprising detectives from various police departments, but they faced a daunting challenge. No fingerprints were found on Carla's body or clothing, and the blood on her dress was attributed to Rodney's head injuries. While traces of bodily fluids were detected, the technology to identify individuals through DNA had not yet been developed, leaving investigators with limited leads to pursue. During that bygone era, the absence of surveillance cameras in parking lots and the lack of license plate readers on highways left law enforcement with limited technological tools. To aid their investigation, the task force established a 24-hour telephone tip line. Callers offered a range of theories about Carla's murderer, including claims that she had fallen victim to marijuana dealers, a carnival worker from the Fort Worth Stock Show and Rodeo, or a solitary young man who frequented the bowling alley where Carla was abducted. Some even spoke of a supposed altercation between Rodney and another boy at Mr. Quick Hamburger's the night before the dance. Yet one anonymous caller provided chilling insight, suggesting that Carla's killer hadn't intended to kill her, but had sinister intentions. The detectives, in their pursuit of any lead, enlisted the help of hypnotists to extract more details from Rodney, who had suffered a head injury during the ordeal. However, the most significant revelation he managed to recall was the kidnapper's brown or tan cowboy hat. When Rodney emerged from the trance, he was overwhelmed with anguish, haunted by the feeling that he hadn't done enough to save his girlfriend. During one of their meetings, the task force detectives delved into another unsolved murder that had occurred almost a year before Carla's disappearance on February 7, 1973. On that fateful night, a young woman named Becky Martin failed to return home after attending a night class at Tarrant County Junior College's South Campus. Her body was discovered nearly seven weeks later, so badly decomposed that the cause of death remained a mystery. The medical examiner suggested possibilities like stabbing, strangulation, or even a gunshot through the stomach. What intrigued the detectives the most about Martin's case was where her body had been found, inside a culvert, 
just outside the city limits. Two young girls, two culverts, a year apart. The eerie coincidence weighed heavily on their minds. While keeping their suspicions guarded from the public eye, investigators embarked on the hunt for a potential serial killer. By March, a month following Carla's tragic murder, the task force was left with a lone lead to pursue. It revolved around a small yet crucial piece of evidence. The magazine clip discovered in the bowling alley parking lot belonged to a more recent 22 Ruger handgun model. With this information in hand, they enlisted the help of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms seeking a list of persons in Fort Worth who had purchased this specific firearm model. The ATF provided them with a list of approximately two dozen names and the task force initiated a series of interviews with each person on the list. Among those individuals was Glenn McCurley, a 31-year-old truck driver. McCurley had grown up in West Texas as the eldest of three boys. His father, Glenn McCurley Sr., had served in World War II before becoming an insurance adjuster. Although proud of his younger sons, whom he considered athletes and good students, Glenn Sr. perceived McCurley as undisciplined and a source of trouble. During his teenage years, McCurley's parents made the decision to send him to Westview Boys Home in southwestern Oklahoma. Westview, sponsored by the Churches of Christ, positioned itself as a sanctuary for boys facing challenges, including those affected by family sickness or loss, those struggling to live with their families, truants, or runaways, and those who had experienced abandonment, abuse, or neglect. The reasons behind McCurley's stay at Westview Boys Home and the exact duration of his time there remain unclear, but it is clear that the experience did not bring about any transformative change. By February 1961, McCurley had left Westview and was in Abilene, where he committed a series of car thefts. His spree led to a confrontation with the State Highway Patrol, who pursued him, eventually shooting out one of his tires. McCurley abandoned the stolen vehicle and attempted a desperate escape on foot, but was swiftly apprehended. The Abilene Reporter News featured the headline, Youth Accused of Auto Theft Here, the following day. In court, McCurley pleaded guilty to the charges and was sentenced to two years in prison. However, he was released early in the spring of 1962 when he was 19 years old. He soon relocated to Midland, where he crossed paths with Judy Watson, a blonde high school student and the daughter of an oil field worker. She was known as an earnest student and a member of the Business Education Club, described by those who knew her as a good girl who hadn't ventured much into the dating scene. McCurley, with his imposing stature, close-cropped brown hair, dark brown eyes, Johnny Cash-style sideburns, and charming dimpled grin captivated her. On February 16, 1963, McCurley and Judy tied the knot in a Baptist church ceremony. A photographer captured their moment as they cut the wedding cake. The newlywed settled into a modest rental home, and McCurley secured a job as a truck driver for the U.S. Postal Service with a route to the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Judy gave birth to two sons, Craig and Roddy. In 1972, McCurley relocated his young family to a neighborhood in West Fort Worth. There, they enrolled their boys in the local public elementary school and became active members of Ridgeley West Baptist Church. McCurley found another truck driving job, transporting prefabricated concrete slabs to construction sites, while Judy contributed to their community by working at the church's daycare center. Within the community center, Judy earned the admiration of parents as she showered the children with affection, described as warm and motherly by one parent. McCurley, while perhaps not as naturally personable as his wife, maintained a solid reputation. In his spare time, he contributed to Ridgeley West Baptist Church, taking on tasks like mowing the lawn and handling necessary repairs. He extended his helpful nature to his neighbors, assisting them with car engine troubles and addressing faulty electrical wiring in their homes. While some who knew McCurley did mention that he had a habit of making remarks about attractive women, it was noted that he never ventured into vulgar or inappropriate territory, at least not in their presence. He was not considered creepy, but rather more inclined towards appreciating beauty in a straightforward manner. In early March 1974, two detectives arrived at McCurley's residence to inquire about his Ruger 22 pistol. 
McCurley informed them that the gun had been stolen from his pickup truck six weeks prior while he was out fishing. Without hesitation, he agreed to accompany the officers downtown to undergo a polygraph test, which he successfully passed. Consequently, the task force removed him from their list of potential suspects. The murder of Carlo Walker remained an unsolved cold case for 46 years until September 2020. During this time, DNA evidence recovered from Walker's clothing was sent to Othram Inc., a company specializing in degraded DNA samples. The Oxygen Network funded the testing. Leads from Othram, coupled with a follow-up investigation by Detectives Wagner and Bennett, ultimately pointed to 77-year-old Glenn Samuel McCurley as a suspect in the crime. In 2020, the police obtained DNA samples from a trash receptacle outside McCurley's home. After confirming that the sample matched the suspect's DNA, investigators interviewed McCurley, who agreed to provide a cheek swab. The matching of the DNA samples provided sufficient evidence to arrest and charge him with the crime. McCurley went on trial in August 2021, and the evidence presented in court included the same pistol he had claimed was stolen in 1974, which had been found concealed inside his home. However, on the third day of the trial, McCurley changed his plea to guilty and was subsequently sentenced to life in prison. Until 2022, he did not admit to killing Carla, stating that he pled guilty because he had enough of being hounded. Investigators suspect that McCurley may have been involved in the rapes and murders of several other young women in the Fort Worth area during the 1970s and 1980s, although he has not been charged with any additional crimes. McCurley was incarcerated in the Gibb Lewis unit and would have been eligible for parole on March 21, 2029. However, he passed away on July 15, 2023. As we wrap up this journey through the chilling annals of true crime, we're left with lingering questions. What drove Glenn McCurley to commit such a heinous act? And what secrets did he harbor for decades? Were there more victims who suffered in silence, waiting for justice to prevail?